Hello everyone, and welcome to day 13 of Advent of Code 2019 in Rust. So, uh, if you have not been following along, uh, this is part of a larger series on YouTube of me coding uh, the Advent of Code 2019 problems in Rust. Uh, we've done uh, days 1 through 12, and today is day 13, even though it is clearly much later than the 13th, but I have gotten behind. Uh, it takes me a long time to make these videos, and I've been busy, um, but we're going to eventually get through all of them. We're just going to be behind a little bit. As you can see, I've done 14 uh, and 13, but I haven't even looked at 15 through 21, um, but we're going to do 13 today and see how it goes. So, um, as I mentioned at the beginning of every video, uh, you can follow along, uh, or you can see the code from... Uh, this series on my GitHub repository, or, or on my GitHub page under a repository called AOC 2019, so BC Myers AOC 2019. And as you can see, the last uh, commit we made was for day 12, part 2, so we're on day 13 now. Um, so I thought I'd give you a preview of what we're going to build today. So here is um, the Advent of Code 2019 problem. Uh, for day 13 asks you to sort of, well, you use your encode computer, which runs a little game. Um, and so here is the game sort of playing uh, on a much slowed down speed and in the web browser. Um, and what's backing all of this is our game is written in Rust um, and the problem is solved in Rust, but we are compiling our Rust code to WebAssembly and then using it in the browser and using the just the basic uh, Canvas API uh, to uh, as the, and, and a little bit of JavaScript to render it in the browser. But this is Rust code running in your browser uh, compiled to WebAssembly. And so hopefully we will complete that and build that today. Um, so with that, I guess I should actually show you the problem. So day 13 is, well, basically you, you have a game, right? There's an arcade cab cabinet, which is an encode program. So the encode pro this encode program here runs that game uh, that we were just looking at. And our job is to essentially build it. Um, so some things we need to know. So it the game has a screen capable of drawing tiles on a grid, right? Tiles on a grid. And, uh, the computer will, once it starts running, output three instructions. The uh, first is the X position that it's talking about, the second is the Y position, and the third is the tile ID, and the tile ID tells you whether or not to draw an empty tile, a wall, a block, a horizontal paddle, or a ball. So, as you can see here, wall, block, paddle, ball, <laughs> if I can chase it around. Um, so the first question just asks us how many block tiles are there once the uh, the game draws to the screen. And I'm going to pause for a second because I've got a uh, fire truck outside. Hold on. All right. So the fire truck or policeman or somebody left. So hopefully that's better. But anyway, the first question is just uh, it, it it wants us to run the game long enough for it to draw the first kind of screen and then asks how many block tiles are on the screen. And then the second question is, uh, it says, once you get all these outputs, then you can give the computer an input, which is essentially how you want to move your joystick, right? Either zero, don't move it, negative one, move it to the left, one, move it to the right. And then it asks you to sort of just play the game and beat the game and figure out what your score is um, at the end of the game. Oh, and I should mention the score is normally the output is an X coordinate, a Y coordinate, and a tile ID. But if you ever get an X coordinate of negative one and a Y coordinate of zero, then the next uh, thing is not a tile ID, it's your score. So every time we hit a block, basically, our score is gonna update. Um, and so that's, that's basically it. Um, and let's get into coding it. Um, so I guess the first thing I should mention is we're gonna have to tear up our computer a little bit because our computer is built assuming that it runs in a separate thread and you send message it, messages to it over a channel to interact with the input and output, uh, which I think was a neat way to write it to solve day seven, I think, 
where the computers were hooked up in series. But it's not going to be good for us now if we want our solution to run in WebAssembly because WebAssembly does not have threads. Mm. So, I guess, oh, first I should mention a little bit about WebAssembly. So WebAssembly is, for those of you who don't know, it is uh, something that all the browsers uh, now support and it's essentially a kind of new language uh, that closely resembles um, sort of machine code or assembly code. Um, it uh, is designed in order to be sort of very, very small. It's a binary format, so um, you're not going to be writing it by hand. Uh, but when you send it, when it goes over the internet, right, it's going to be sort of small in size, um, which is important for the internet. Um, and it's also designed to be, the, the assembly instructions in WebAssembly are, are very close to sort of native machine code. So it's designed to be able, uh, for the browser to be able to compile it to native machine code very, very quickly once it receives like a, a bunch of WebAssembly. And so um, if you write WebAssembly, uh, so it, it, for those of you who know, like the browser can run JavaScript, right? Well. Uh, like there's essentially a JavaScript interpreter inside every browser. I think it's called V8 in Chrome, and it's called uh, Spider Monkey in Firefox, and it's called something else on Safari. Um, and uh, up until recently, that was sort of the only programming language that browsers understood. But well, now they understand they understand WebAssembly, so uh, we're going to be writing in that. And so WebAssembly is small and it's extremely fast because it gets compiled straight to machine code um, by the browser. Uh, so how do you write WebAssembly? Well, you write um, C or C++ or Rust or some other language, and you compile down to WebAssembly. That gives you a WebAssembly file, and then that's what you send over uh, to the browser, and the browser compiles that to machine code and runs it. Um, I think. It might interpret the WebAssembly, but I think it compiles it. I'm not sure. But anyway, the browser knows how to run WebAssembly. Um, but WebAssembly is a binary format. You don't want to write it by hand, so you write in Rust or C or C++, and you compile the WebAssembly. So there's a couple crates that facilitate this that we'll be using um, when you write Rust. The first is WASM bindgen, which is absolutely critical, um, and I will explain later. And it has a nice book uh, that tells you all about WASM bindgen. Um, and then there's another sort of tool or... Um, interesting crate that we'll be using called WASMPack. And WASMPack is just a way to have all of the build steps to be able to build from Rust code into WebAssembly um, and the sort of JavaScript shim that you need to go around it. It does all this for you and it's great and it has a book. Um, but really the book, if you want to learn about this from scratch and you sort of don't know anything, the resource I would suggest is this. This is a different book than these other two books and it's called uh, the the URL is rustwasm.github.io slash doc slash book slash introduction and this walks you through um, a, a tutorial for setting up Conway's Game of Life in WebAssembly or let's see if I can so here's Conway's Game of Life here's a picture of what it looks like these things like move around um, so it walks you through a tutorial and it, it tells you crates you should know about. So WASM Bindgen we just mentioned, WASM Bindgen Futures if you want to interact with JavaScript promises, JS Sys which gives you access to, um, well, a, a bunch of JavaScript global types and methods, Web Sys which gives you access to the web APIs and the DOM, um, a whole bunch of stuff. Uh, right, so this is my recommendation for the book to go to if you want to read about this more on your own and from scratch. Oh, and as an honorable mention, I wanted to say this WebAssembly stuff is not just for the web. Uh, so this is not really fully baked yet, but there's no reason why WebAssembly can't be like almost a universal target uh, and run not just in browsers, but just natively on your machine. Um, uh, and so there's this project called WASI, the WebAssembly System Interface, which is basically taking WebAssembly and extending it so that it can be run um, not in the sandboxed web browser environment, but in um, like on a regular machine. And so it's adding things like uh, here's what's in the current WASI preview. It's adding things like uh, accessing the system clock, um, accessing files. Uh, 
messing with the file system, accessing random numbers, sockets, all these sort of things that you get when you're writing code that runs on your native OS, but you don't get when you're writing code in the browser. Um, there's no sort of file system in the browser. There's no random number generator. I don't think that you can use in WebAssembly right now. And so all of this stuff is coming, which means learning how to build things and compile them to WebAssembly is not just for writing stuff that runs in the browser. Soon it will be something uh, that you can use in order to write code um, that can run across many, many different environments. Um, I won't mention, well, uh, in any case, that's just a little bit of a preview of what's to come with WebAssembly. Um, but for right now, you can run it in the browser with a restricted set of APIs that work in the browser. Um, so for example, threads, uh, threads don't work in the browser, which is why, getting back to our actual code, we need to change our computer. So our computer needs to be able to run on a single thread. Um, so we can no longer put it on a separate thread and sort of send messages, uh, I guess, asynchronously to it and, and receive messages from it. We need to have a mode for the computer where it runs single threaded. So this is fairly. This should be fairly easy to. It should be fairly easy to adjust our computer to do this. But I just want to think about how to do this and make it robust. So the first thing I'm going to do to not get confused is to alphabetize all of our types, which is something I should have done a while ago. Because um, I'm going to be adding more types and moving them around. So let's just get everything in alphabetic order so I can find myself in this file, which is getting fairly, I mean fairly big for a Rust file. Um, I usually don't like my Rust modules to be any bigger than this. Let's move channel below computer. So computer at the top and then alphabetical for everything below computer. That makes sense to me. Alright, do you still compile? You should still compile. Okay, good. So we've moved everything around. Now, our computer, well, it's going to need to be public because we're going to call it from WebAssembly, which I'm going to make a completely different crate. And we are now going to make it generic over a queue type. So instead of taking a channel specifically, we're going to make it take a queue, which sounds good to me. And these seem like they need to be up here. Sure. Um, so that's our computer type. Um, and sure, we'll implement default for computer. Um, but we can only implement default where Q itself implements default. So this can just be Q default and Q default, right? Okay. Uh, let's rearrange these things because I want to. Um, all right. So we'll deal with constructors later. I'm going to name this something different, I think. So we need the impl. We're now generic over Q, and now Q needs to implement a trait. Q needs to be a Q, um, which we have not created yet. This is a trait we are going to create that will allow us to create a computer with just a straight up um, vec deck in the single threaded case or a channel in the multi threaded case. So let's go ahead and create our Q type, um, our Q trait. So pub trait Q. A queue just knows how to do two things. Um, it knows how to in queue something. Um, and it knows how to dequeue something. So that's all we are going to need for our Q traits. 
And so now this should stop yelling at us that Q does not exist. We're going to rename this to run, because I just feel like it. And it's no longer going to take a ROM. It's just going to be, you're just going to have a run method on the computer. Which means that no longer needs to happen. And this no longer needs to happen. And it's also no longer going to return anything. Just a simple run method that just runs and then we'll deal with uh, pulling things in or out of the computer uh, differently. So actually run is going to be different across different queue types, but that's okay. So read instruction is not going to change, I think, at all. We're still reading instructions in exactly the same way. But when we execute an instruction, if we ever come across an input instruction, what we need to do is keep track of the fact that we need an input and then sort of yield to the user to allow them to give us an input. Um, so let's come down here and create two new types. Um, One's going to be public enum state. So the computer can be in one of several states. It can be done, meaning it halted. It can be in a state of uh, needs input, right? And it can be in a state of has output. We're going to yield, whenever we need input, uh, whenever we run into an input instruction, we're going to sort of yield to the user and ask them to supply it. Um, and then whenever we have output, we're gonna yield to the user and give them a chance to uh, use that output. Um, and then we're obviously going to um, sort of yield to the user when we're done running. Um, and so we're gonna have this state type. We're also gonna have an internal state type, which is gonna keep track of, really the computer can be in four different states. It can be done, it can be executing, it can be in the needs input state and in that state we're going to need to know you'll see above we're going to need to keep track of once we get the input where do we write it to and then it can be in the has output state um, and this is just going to be internal that we keep track of this is going to be a public facing type so how are we going to do that well let's first of all keep track of the state we're in in the computer right so the computer has a state, which is state internal. Um, and it's going to start out in the executing phase or state. Um, and instead of doing well, let's get back. Let's let's ignore the run function for a second. Let's create a function that just takes one step and then yields to the user, which is what we want, what we really want. So let's say you can call step on a computer. You need to give it mutable reference to self, and it will return you the result of a state. So it you call step, it does as much as it can. And then when it's finished, it tells you either I'm done, or I need input, or I have output for you to do something with. Um, so then you do whatever you want to do, and then you can call step again, and it will continue to run, right? So we're, we're sort of doing cooperative, I guess this is a version of like single-threaded cooperative multitasking, <laughs> if that makes any sense, and that's probably not right. Uh, but that's what we're building, right? So um, so we want to take a step. Great. Oh, one thing that I'm super excited about is Rust version. What's my Rust version? Rust C dash dash version. Can I do that? 
Oh yeah, Rust 140 came out a couple days ago, and they they stabilized the to do uh, macro, which means I no longer have to write unimplemented, which I always spell wrong or incorrectly, and is hard to type. And as you probably noticed, I don't have tab completion set up in my editor, and so I type everything out. Uh, I probably should set up tab completion somehow. Um, but this is like a huge lifesaver for me. So I'm going to start using to do everywhere instead of unimplemented. It's wonderful. And it's brand new. Um, so anyway, we'll call to do on that. But what I really want to do is when we come down here and we execute an instruction, right? Well, if we are supposed to be popping something off the input queue, here we need to make sure we yield, right? And. Um, and ask the user for input. So what we're going to do here is we're going to set our state to our internal state to state internal um, needs input, and we're going to keep track of this W where we write things, right? And then we are going to return OK. Um, and not do any of this business yet. Because if we reach this instruction, right, we will not have anything in the input queue because we have no way to send things to the input queue. We're operating on one thread. We have to yield to the user and wait for the user to give us some input and restart us. Um, and so, why is it mismatch types? Oh, because W is W down here is not an I64. It's a pointer. It's a place where you write things to. So it's going to be a U64. All right, so let's come back up here. Um, oh, and this is an option. What we really could do is we could have execute instruction return us the new state. Let's do that execute instruction is going to do some stuff and it's going to tell us what's the state that you're in now. Well, no, that's fine. We'll just have it return. We'll have it return that. All right, and similarly, if output, if we have output, if we got an output instruction, right, it means that we've added something to our output queue. Uh, but then we want to inform the user that we have received some output and so we want to yield here. So we want to set self.state equals state internal has output after of course output after of course we actually put the output on the queue. Well, I mean we can do that, right? Um, and then we want to return okay. Not hash output. Has output. And the reason why there's no pushback here is because we're now using a generic queue. So we're going to enqueue something. We're going to enqueue something, right? Um, which is essentially just a way to say pushback. But um, you'll see why I named it enqueue uh, later. Um, but remember, we're now all of these methods are generic over Q, where Q implements our trait Q. It's kind of confusing that the letter Q and this word Q are the same, but whatever, you guys get it. So our our output and input are now these Q thingies uh, for all these methods here, and so we need to use uh, in Q here. All right, so if we have an add instruction or multiply or all these others except for halt which is special so we're going to make sure self dot state equals well in that case we're just we're just executing right and we don't have to yield um, and then we return okay so for all of these others we're going to fall through here and just make sure we're in the executing state however if we get a halt instruction well then self dot state Right is obviously state internal done, and we return OK. So 
hopefully that's executed instruction all sort of reworked. But I noticed the other day, so we're going to change this too. Remember we changed writes and reads to no longer have out of bounds errors. And so uh, let's go down to, so our memory, right? You have this ability to read uh, out of memory and write to memory. Um, but these things, if you come look at their implementations on VEC of I64s, they can no longer fail, right? Because, uh, well, we're dynamically resizing the memory if we ever try and read or write out of bounds. And so these should, should have been corrected before. These can no longer error, right? Um, because we are dynamically growing them. And so we need to fix all of this, which is gonna flow through the code. This no longer returns a result either. It just returns that and that. So that's correct. So our implementations are fixed, but now we need the traits, the trait to reflect that. So this just now returns an I64, and this returns nothing, which means we will not need question marks on all these. But these read opcode, read signed, all these things will still return an error because as you can see, right, this can, read opcode can error if we ever have a negative opcode. And it's gonna be the same for all of these, but we need to take these question marks off of the raw read and write methods. There we go, there we go. Um, okay, so if we come up here, that's also gonna cause us some problems because in execute instruction, we're using these write and read methods, but these write and read methods no longer can fail. Do, 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 do. So stop failing, stop failing. And the reason why I wanted to do that is because I believe this can no longer fail. So execute instruction just straight up returns nothing. You execute the instruction, it sets the internal internal state, and it's done, right? So return, return. Return, and here you return nothing. All right. Input mute is wrong because this is no longer a channel. This is an at mute queue. And this is an at mute queue. And I don't think we need this anymore. What we do, what I do want to add to this is the, if you have a computer, I want you to be able to read and write just straight from memory. These need to be public. But let's make them public anyway. So I want you to be able to just read and write from memory. So remember, we can potentially grow. If we try and read out of bounds, we're going to grow our memory. And so this needs to be mutable. So at mute self and give me the pointer that you want to read. And I will give you back an i64. And this is just going to be self.ram.read pointer. And let's have an ability to write directly to the memory at this address, um, this value, and that cannot fail. And we just say self.ram.write pointer value. Good. So channel, we want to be able to use a channel as a queue. So, So I'm going to get rid of this try clear thing, which you'll see in a second. But what we want to do is we want to say we want to impl queue for channel i64. And remember, we need two methods for a queue. We need in queue, q u e u e, which takes a mutable self and a value, which is an i64 and it just enqueues it. And so that is going to be this, 
which means we no longer need pushback here. And this, we need a DQ method, which is going to pop something off the queue. Uh, maybe. And for a channel, it's going to be this. Which means we no longer need this. Um, good. So now our channel implements the queue trait, and we can use it inside our computer. Um, well, a channel of i64s works. The channel of t's does not work. Um, OK. But what we also want, right? I guess I'll do this down at Q. We also want to be able to use just a straight up vectec because if we're going to be doing this on a single thread, like why mess with channels, right? It's just overhead that we don't need. So let's impl Q for a vectec of i64s, which means we're going to need probably use standard collections vectec. We will implement DQ and NQ, and you can see why I, I named them this because otherwise the names would conflict, which you can you can totally do that in Rust. Like this could have a method called pop front, and the trick you could also implement a different method called pop front. Um, and there's a way to sort of differentiate between whether or not you meant the actual method of vectec pop front or whether or not you meant the pop front that is associated with a queue that VecDeck also implements because it's a queue, but it's just easier to name them something different. <laughs> so, um, but this is like super easy to dequeue something from a queue. We just say self dot uh, pop front, uh, self dot pop front, which returns an option, right? So then we just turn that into a result by saying OK or else error um, attempted to pop something off the queue, but queue was empty. Um, and for in queue, even simpler, self dot push back val. Right? So now we can create a computer where the queues we use are just straight up vectex as opposed to having to use channels. Um, but we can also use channels, right? Um, because we implemented queue for channel. Um, all right, so we read an instruction and we execute an instruction and executing instruction uh, sets our state to either Executing needs input, has output, done, or executing, right? So in our step here, what we need to do is we need to say, what state are we in? Um, well, actually, probably what we do is we, no, yeah, we say what state we're, we match what state we're in. So match self dot state. If we are in, we can be in one of four states. State internal done. Well then, we return to the user. In that case, we tell the user, hey, we're just done, right? So we return OK of the external state done. We can be in state internal executing, in which case we want to read another instruction right which gets us an instruction and then we want to execute that instruction self dot execute instruction instruction which can no longer fail and then we want to do it again. So this is a loop. Um, so as long as we can keep executing, keep executing, right? Like why yield at all? 
um, just keep doing it, right? Um, if we ever run into this, if this ever sets our state to like needs input or something, then we'll loop back around, come up here, and we'll realize we need input, and then we'll do something else. So in the case that we do need input, needs input, we're going to have a w, right? And what we're going to do here is we're going to try to pop something off the input queue. So we're going to say, let, well, we're going to say match self dot input dot dq. Try to dq something from the input. And if we got something back, then that's fine. All we need to do is self dot write, self dot ram dot write at address w, the value that we got back. And then we need to say, well, we no longer are in the state of needs input. We are in the state internal executing because we don't need input anymore. We fixed it, right? Um, but if we got an, if we were unable to pop anything from the queue for whatever reason, right? Well, then we need to yield to the user so that the user could put something on the queue for us. So we yield to the user by returning OK state uh, need needs input. And apparently I, this should be needs input, there we go. Um, so the last case to cover is if we're in state internal has output. Well, we don't need to do anything, but we need to give the user an opportunity to pop something off the output queue if they want to. So we'll just return here OK uh, state needs, no, has output, right? Um, but before we do that, I mean, we should be able to continue executing, right? This is just to give the user a chance to, um, to pop something off if they want to. So when they restart, when they call step again and they restart the computer, we want to be in the executing state because we can continue to execute, I think. So we say, we say, okay, well, we, we, can, we can continue executing the next time you call step, but we're going to yield and let you know we have some output. And I think that should be correct. So, uh, so that is sort of running as far, this, this will let the user call a function so that it runs the computer as much as the computer runs, it can run before either it's done, in which case we signal the user it's done, or it needs input, in which case we signal the user it needs, it needs input, which only happens here if there's nothing on the input queue. Um, or if it has output, and here we just let the user get a chance to pull it off the output, pull stuff off the output queue if they want. So that's our new step function. And so run is just going to be So here's where we need to differentiate, I think, between whether or not we have a generic queue or whether or not we have a queue that's meant for multi-threaded versus one that's meant for single-threaded. Uh, this can be derived. Oh, and I don't want to implement default here, actually, because notice we no longer are passing the, we have to pass the, um, we have to pass the uh, the ROM in somehow to the computer. And so really what I want to do 
is I want to have I want to impl computer I want one impl block for computer vec deck i64 and I want a separate implementation for computer of channel of i64. Can you spell vec deck? Okay, good. No. <laughs> vec D E Q U E. Just like that. Okay. So here we're going to have a new function. Pub function new. And you're just going to take. This is where we're going to pass in the ROM when we create the computer. So ROM R. This returns self, um, and ROM is ROM can be anything that, as a reference, can be just like before a slice of i64s, and so then we just say self, and. We create a self. So the program counter starts at zero, the relative base starts at zero, the RAM is ROM as ref to VEC. The state internal starts out at executing. The input is just a VEC deck default, and the output is a VEC deck. Default. Good. So that's how we create a single threaded computer. And how we create a multi threaded computer is for its new method, I want you to have to specify the channel. So you, you need to give me a ROM, plus you need to give me an input channel, plus you need to give me an output channel. And here, this will be the input channel you passed me, and this will be the output channel you passed me, and otherwise everything else will be the same. Um, and we can even create, in order to make it easier for our users, we can have pub type computer single threaded is computer of a vec deck of i64s, and pub type computer multi threaded is a computer of channels of i64s. So we've got our generic computer. We know how to create a single threaded one, right? Um, and I guess to make this clear, we can make this. Can you do this? Can I do that? Oh no, I can't do that. Oh well. Um, so we've got a way to construct a single threaded one and a way to construct a multi-threaded one and then our all of our other methods here are generic. Um, but the step function, you don't really need the step function, right, if you are doing the If you're using the multi-threaded computer, when would you ever need the step function? Well, I guess you wouldn't, but let's just keep it there. But what we what we need, right, is a run function um, that just runs to the end. And we'll be able to use the run function even on the single-threaded, just for problems where it doesn't require um, it doesn't require input, right? Um, but app mute self, this will return a result of nothing or an error. 
right? And all we do here is in a in a loop, right? We match on self dot step, and if self dot step returns state done, well then we just return okay, and if it returns state dot has output. Uh, we're going to try and run through as fast as we possibly can and not stop, so we're just going to return OK. But if it is state needs input, which means it needs input and the user has to provide it, but we're on the single threaded, so we can't finish an entire run without sort of yielding, and I want this run method to be to return an error if that's the case. So we won't be able to use this run method like uh, you know, cannot use run function for, you know, or it's error like needs input. Oh, has output, sorry. Has output doesn't return. Has output just does nothing. And you call step again. Um, And step can fail, which is why that's not working. So if we have a single threaded computer and we try and run it all the way through, it will work and run to the end unless the program calls for getting input, in which case we'll bail and, and the user will have to, in those circumstances, use the step method and sort of you know, keep stepping and if, it, if the computer ever needs input, it'll have to give it to them. Um, but this should be the similar except for well let's think about what happens here in the case of the multi-threaded computer so you hit needs input right and we try and DQ something but this on the multi-threaded computer will just block until input is there, right? And so this should never fail, which means we should never hit this case, which means this this should be the same for both single-threaded and multi-threaded, I think. I think. What happens when you DQ on a channel? You... Well, yeah, the only the only way we can get an error here is if we timed out, and that 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 is like a solid error, right? So I think this run method can actually be the same for both. So let's move it down here and get rid of this one. So this is if you want to attempt to run it all the way through, and this is if you want to just step, keep stepping. And this is what we needed to add in order to be able to run our game in single-threaded mode. And I think that might be our computer all fixed up. But now we just need to fix in the code all the places where we use the computer. Starting with down here. So we create a computer like this now. New um, ROM. And when we create a computer, we're going to have to tell it what kind of computer it is because it's ambiguous. There are two new methods. Multiple. And down here we need to say computer.write. So instead of having noun, this noun and verb business, we're just going to write the noun and the verb directly to memory. 
so to firm because this is now computer.run to the end and it takes no arguments and it returns nothing as well and this is oh we know we need a computer ram method sure we get rid of our ram method but we're testing the ram so But it seems like even if I specify the type here, it can't disambiguate between this new method and this new method. So let's just call these different things. New multi-threaded. New single threaded. Well maybe it's because of this. See if I can get away with calling them the same thing if I do that. No, still not working. What if I tell you computer back deck? If you know you want to be that, can you disambiguate? Nope. Oh, what if I did this? I bet that would work. There we go. There's probably a better way to do this, um, but we're just gonna leave it like that for now. So we need to go through and update, every time we're using the computer, we need to sort of update it for our new API. So that's in day two. This is now computer single threaded new ROM. This is computer uh, run question mark. Oh, but we got to prime it with the computer dot write to memory address one twelve. Computer write to memory address two. This is the noun and the verb, right? Oh shoot! And were those the right numbers? Prime it with one position is twelve and the two position is two. Yeah. Okay. This does not this cannot fail. And then we need to look at computer.read zero let answer one equals. Right? And then this is going to be similar. Down here, um, we create a new computer. We write the noun and the verb. We run the computer, and if computer.read zero is that, then we found our answer too. And why did we not break here? That seems like something we should have been doing all along, right? No need to continue to try stuff once we've already found the answer. Um, okay, so hopefully that works. We use the computer in day five. So uh, day five, I think, 
can, we can also use our simpler single threaded computer here. So computer new. Let's use the single threaded computer. Uh, oh, we're going to need a, it's going to need the ROM. Oops. Let's use our Q type or Q trait. So here instead of pushback, I mean, since it knows this is a VEC deck, we can use pushback, but let's, um, for the fun of it, let's use uh, in Q. Um, and this becomes computer run. Run to the end, run to the end. And this, is now pop not front but pop back we don't know no longer need to do that but we do need to create a new computer because our computer is what resets the ROM so just because it's fun, let's use in queue here, even though it does the same thing. And this is going to be again pop back. And this is run. And that should work. I think day seven is the next one, if I remember correctly. Oh, here's something I want to do. We created this janky factorial function, but this is, uh, we have a utilities folder now. So let's move factorial into here uh, and make it pub create. And actually, let's make, let's put all of these in a math module just because they belong together. GCF, LCM, factorial all belong in a pub create math module. Um, and factorial, there was something else I noticed about factorial while I was updating this code. Oh, hold on. Uh, use create error. Well, use superstar. Hmm. So, uh, answer is blah, blah, blah. If x minus 1 equals 0, break. Oh, if... So with factorial, this can be one, right? Because when you multiply by one, you get the same answer. So we we can stop when n is two. So we multiplied by two here. We updated the answer. So after that, we don't need to multiply by one. We're done. Hopefully you guys are following that. Um, all right, so now we have a little utils math module and we've used that many places. So here we say use, create, utils, I don't know, math. And this will be let in channels equals math factorial, factorial of in computers. And this was another error here. See how I'm doing the factorial function twice? That was stupid. I should memoize the answer. Um, and just do that once. So that's another small error that I noticed when I was making changes that we should fix. All right, so that's factorial function. Put in its own, put in the utilities module and sort of fixed and memoized as opposed to recomputed twice for no reason. Actually, not twice, uh, six times for no reason. <laughs> um, okay, uh, so here uh, in day, we have a computer. So day, is this, we're in day seven. This is where we actually need to use the multi-threaded computer. So computer multi-threaded new, right? Oh, and it needs the ROM. And so now we need computer multi-threaded, right? 
Um, and we're gonna need Q because down here this is not pushed back anymore. This is in Q, in Q U E, and this is in Q, and this is run. And this is DQ. Um, and that should probably, yeah, that fixes day seven. Where else do we use the computer? Day eight? I don't think so. Day nine? Yes. Okay. Day nine, we use the computer. So. I think this can just be single threaded as well. Yeah. anymore but need to create a new computer should work. We're about done here. Yeah, done here we need computer single threaded new pass it a ROM and computer dot run dot unwrap and computer output mute try iter collect. We can just get this, can just be uh, oh, because these are tests. Let's we can't create a single slice out of a vec deck because it's a ring buffer, so that it, there might it might actually be like back by two you two slices is this said to one. So let's just turn this into a vector. How did I do this? If you have a vec deck, if you have a vec deck, how do we look at everything in it? Um, so We can just, uh, we can't create a vector, but we can just iterate over all the values and collect them into a vector. We'll probably have to. Probably have to say map. them because they're copy types. Okay, that works. Now, let's go to day 10. Do we use our computer here? Looks like we did not. Day 11. We used our computer here. Alright. 
So the robot. Let's just to make this easy, we're using the multi-threaded computer. So let's continue to use the multi-threaded computer. Computer multi-threaded. And so hopefully that just works. Do we have any tests down here? Nope. Um, and day 12, we did not use the computer. And day 13 is what we're building now. And so let's cross our fingers and hope all of these changes to the computer actually worked. Cargo, check. Oh, in day 12, this is no longer, this is now math. I'll see you. Let's see, day 11, our computer does not need to be mutable. Where's 53? Sure it does. Oh, because run, that's, okay, computer uh, function run, this should be at mute self. Cargo check. Can't leak create visible type. Well, let's make the channel pub create or pub then. Oh, and this is we only use this for tests, right? Um, which means it doesn't really need to be public. And try iter is never used. I guess it is never used. Let's get rid of it. Um, channel needs to be channel needs to be public. Let's just make it a public type. All right, cargo check. Hey, it runs. So let's run our tests using SIMD and not SIMD. Uh, cargo test. Let's see if we're back to where we were before. I would be very surprised if this works. Actually, I'm going to take a break to make some coffee and I'll save you guys the compiling. I'll be back in a second. So, still making coffee, but it looks like our test did not pass because we moved around GCF and in our tests we did not account for that. So, that's in utils down here in the tests. I guess what we need to do, let's have the test for the math functions be in the math module. So, mod tests we don't need that anymore probably we don't need that anymore why is this pub crate <laughs> um, GCF and this will leave down below but that way we test our GCF function here in our math module and down here we get rid of this right and don't need that anymore. And let's kick it off again. Uh-oh. It got stuck on something. I know, day 12 just took a really long time. Was that day 12? Yeah, day 12 took a really long time. What was day 12? Oh, day 12 should take a long time. This is the thing where you have to do tons of iterations. So maybe when I run the tests, I should run them on release mode, just so it runs faster. All 
I will pause. The, I'm going to go finish the coffee and pause, but I expect this to pass, and I will come back in a second. Okay, coffee is made, and indeed the test passed. Um, and I want to run them in the background with dash dash release, just so that sort of compiles and starts getting ready to go. Um, all right, so we're to a point where everything passes and we modified our computer. So I think I want to commit here, um, just because we made some significant changes and then we will tackle day 13. Um, so we basically just updated our computer so that you can, um, so that it will yield to you when it needs input or has output and so we can run it on a single thread and we can use it in WebAssembly which it was not capable of being run really on a single thread when you need input and output before. And all of this looks good. So oh, we can fix this later if it's bad. So git status. Yeah, git add all, git commit m. Um, Create single threaded computer in prep for WASM. Get push. There we go. So now we're ready to solve um, day 13. Um, which again is a game. It's a Pong-like game, right? So I'm going to start out by saying struct Pong. Pong, the game, is going to have a computer, which is going to be a single-threaded computer. Oops. So use create computer we're probably going to need computer single threaded and we're probably going to need ROM at the very least. Um, it's going to have a display which I'm going to represent as a vector of bytes for the moment. And it's going to have a bunch of state which we will get to. And it needs to be public because we're going to use it from a WebAssembly crate uh, library that we'll make. So, the game needs to have a new method, which will Take in uh, ROM. Uh, right? And output itself. R is as ref I64. And this will just be self, computer, computer. ST new ROM as ref and display. Oh, I already know. So if you solve the problem, you sort of figure out like what the number of rows and columns in the display is. And we could figure that out, but we might as well. Um, I'm going to hard code them. So the, row, the number of rows in the display is um, 26. And the number of columns in the display is 40. So when we come down here and we create a vec with capacity, uh, it's going to be 26 by 40. And our tests did indeed pass. Uh, on release mode, so that's good. And there is no with capacity. Capacity. There we go. 
And it looks like we won't even need ROM because we can take in a slice of something that adds refs into a slice of U8s. Um, okay. So we're going to need, in the WebAssembly, it, uh, I guess I'll explain this later, but we're going to need um, to get a handle to the display um, as a pointer to it. So you will see this when I do the WebAssembly glue code, but we're going to need this to be a pointer to bytes, which is just self.display as pointer. And we're also going to need to know the length of that for WebAssembly. So display len is self u size self dot display dot len. Um, it's also going to have to know the rows and the columns. So let's say rows is a const fn rows self u size just give me rows and pub const function calls self u size just give me calls um, okay so the computer has the the, the game I think this makes more sense to call itself a game. The game has a computer inside it and it has a display. And we can create a new one, which loads the ROM. Now we need to, I guess, just run the game, right? This is probably going to be at me itself. It's probably going to return. Well, actually, let's take one step through the game first. Step at me itself. And it's probably going to return. I don't know what this is going to return yet. So if the game takes one step, what happens? Um, oh, I think maybe we need an input to the game too. So if we go to prop day 13. And for the part one, you don't give it any, you don't write, you don't give it any input. But for part two, it says something like uh, memory address zero represents the number of quarters that have been inserted. Set it to two to play for free. So basically, before we do anything, we want to put quarters in our machine. So computer is going to be this. And this needs to be mutable. And then before we even create the game, let's say computer.write at memory address 0, 2, which is the way we tell it we want two quarters in the machine, and then computers here. All right, so we, we put our quarters in the machine, we, uh, in the computer. We have the computer. We have the display. Now we need to step through the game. Um, and now that we have a single threaded uh, game, this should be relatively straightforward. So the game is going to output, the computer program is going to start running and, out, and it's going to start outputting a bunch of coordinates that describe the world, right? Um, and remember, it's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to output three things. Ooh, where did that go? My Firefox just crashed. Interesting. Oh no, it didn't crash. Something happened. Okay, it's going to output three things. An X position, a Y position, and a tile ID. But it's going to do that many, many, many times before it needs input from us, right? So first, let's get all of these outputs that it's going to give us to draw the screen. So match self.computer.step. So let's move the computer forward one step which means we're going to need a uh, state here, which I hope I made public. OK, so either the computer is going to be in a state of done, or, oops, 
or it's going to be in a state of needs input, or it's going to be a state of has output. And I think there's the only three possibilities, right? Actually, let's just do this all in a loop and forget step. So this will just be run the game. All right. So if we're done, then we return OK. Because the game is over. This can fail. All right. If we need input, let's do that later. Has output. So this is the first thing the computer is going to do. It's going to come back to us and it's going to say, hey, I have some output. So what we want to do is the first output will be the x value. So we say self.computer.outputmute.dq question mark. Um, and this can actually be, this can be unwrapped because if we ever get has output, we know there's output. Which means we're going to need the Q trait that we created. Um, but really, we want to keep track of this X and keep track of the Y and keep track of the ID. And so in the game struct, I'm going to have, we're going to have an X value, which is going to be an option of an I64. We're going to have a Y value, which is going to be an option of an I64. And we're going to have an ID, which is going to be an option of an I64. Um, I mean, this doesn't really, this could be up here, but let's just keep it, let's just keep it in the game. Why not? Um, and so these are going to start out at none and none and So really what happens is we're going to get an X first, but so this loop works for not only X's, but Y's and everything, right? Let's just say if X is none, so if we don't have an X yet, well then our X is this, right? So let X equal that and self dot X if self dot X is none, self dot X equals some X. And then continue because we got that input. We we got that out. It, the computer outputted an X, and we captured it. Um, if so, the next go round will get a Y. This will not pass because we already have the X, but Y will be none. And so we just do this for Y. So let's shorten this and do that and say self.x equals that and continue so that this becomes shorter. So self.y will be the next value off the queue. And then here, if self.id is none, then the next value is the id. But it turns out that if self.x is sum and self dot y is sum and self dot id is sum. Well, then we have everything we need to know what for a tile, right? So we can say let x equals self dot x dot unwrap. Let y equals self dot y dot unwrap and let z or let id equals self dot id dot unwrap. Um, and we almost have a tile, but remember if x is negative one and y is zero, then the id is actually a score, it's not a tile. So we can keep track of our score up here. We'll start it out at zero. And I think the score can only be positive, but to be safe, let's make it an I64. Um, so here, if x equals negative one and y equals zero, 
Well then, we know that the score is the ID, and we continue. Otherwise, we have a point. Um, so all I want to do is write the ID into our display buffer. So the way to do that is to say self dot display at um, it'd be well if, if if we were on the first row it would just be x. So these probably need to be. Oh no, we can't make it a U size yet. Because it can be negative here. But once we get past here, x and y will never be negative. So we can say as U size equals ID. expecting the ID to only be 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. Um, 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4. So if it's anything different, if ID is greater than 4, or ID is less than 0, then we have a problem. You know, um, saved invalid ID. ID, and then this can be as you ate. And my coffee is done brewing, so I'm going to take a second to pour it. I have a nice fresh cup of coffee. All right, but this only works if we're talking about the first row, so we need to get y involved in here. So y is u size. So if it's zero, then that's fine. But what we need to do is multiply by the number of columns here and then add that, I think. And I think this will write, this will write the ID into the right x, y coordinate of our display buffer. Um, and clearly, if we've done all this, right, we, we've sort of recorded the x, the y, and the id, well then we need to reset them back to, we need to say self.x equals none, and self.y equals none, and self.id equals none, so that the next time we go around, right, all of these things will be reset and we'll start collecting them again. So, I think that is, has output all done. And with needs input, let me see if I can run uh, let me run the this again so you guys can see what the pong game looks like. Uh, is it here? Yeah, okay. Are you done compiling? Compile your WebAssembly stuff. Try and refresh. Uncaught exception to do. Uh oh. There's something wrong with my practice website. So I can't pull up the thing that I showed you. I don't know what I changed in the meantime. I changed something. I broke I broke my practice website. So anyway, the point is is that if we need input, uh, there's there's like a you saw the pong game, right? There's a ball that has some x y coordinate, and then there's a paddle that has some x y coordinate. And when the program needs input, we need to give it a negative one if we move, want to move the paddle left, a positive one if we want to move the paddle right, or a zero if we want the paddle to stay in the same spot. So when it asks for input, all we need to do is figure out wherever the ball is, say it's over here, and wherever the paddle is, say it's over here. Well, if the paddle is over here, we want it to move left to chase the ball. 
If, however, the situation is reversed, where the ball is over here and the paddle is over here, well, then we want the paddle to move right. So all the paddle needs to do, right, is chase the ball around. So we'll keep track of where the ball is, where the x-coordinate of the ball is. Um, which I guess is, uh, let's just start, let's just start it out at zero. Th these could be options and where the paddle is, but let's start them out at zero. So the ball's X position is some I-64 and the paddle's X position is some I-64. And so down here, right, we want to actually match on the ID and if the ID, what's the ball? We want to know if the ID is three, we want to record where the paddle is. So if it's three, then we want to say self.paddle equals X, right? And if we're looking at the ball, if we got an update on where the ball is, we want to say self.ball equals X. And if we got a zero or a one or a two, then we're good and we do nothing because we don't care and anything else, that's where we can throw this error here. And now this is no longer needed, but we've also um, updated, updated, now we know where the paddle is and where the ball is. Um, and so if the computer ever asks us for input, right, here, well, then all we need to do is say if self.paddle, the exposition of the paddle is less than self.ball, well then uh, self.computer dot input mute dot in queue in queue we want to move right, right? And else if self.paddle is greater than self.ball, well then we want to move left, which we do by giving it a negative one. And otherwise, we want to stay where we are, which we do by giving it a zero. And I think, ladies and gentlemen, this might be the logic of the game completely done. Uh, except for we need to count, for answer one, we need to count the number of blocks. And blocks are two. Well, let's, let's do that later. Let's just answer number two first. So let's say, oh, we are going to need a ROM. Because we're going to say let ROM equals ROM from reader, reader, question mark. And then we say let game equal let mute game equals game new ROM. And then game, game dot run, question mark. And Answer two is game.score, right? So let's try and run this and see what happens. Cargo run day 13 with data 13. Oh, I'm in the wrong folder. Go back to lib AOC 2019. Cargo run day 13 with data 13. Index out of bounds. The length is zero, but the index is zero. Oh, um, we need to fill. Okay, when we're creating this vector, this is not vec with capacity. We need to fill this with uh, empty space, empty tile, zero. So this needs to be. This vec needs to be initialized to all zeros. So vec zero 
and the number of things we want is calls times rows. Okay, now we should not get index out of bounds. But we got a score of zero, which is not good. So let's see if we're getting some coordinates. We are indeed getting a bunch of coordinates. Um, are we updating the score? We are not updating the score. Seems like we're playing the game. We're getting the board, right? But the computer program is halting. I mean, it must be halting, right? Obviously. Let's just make sure it is halting. Yeah, it's halting. Okay. No, I, don't, I didn't really need to do that. Uh, you can go away and you can be a comma. Hmm. Oh. Um, we need to reset. These need to be reset here, too, but we're never hitting that case. Um, let's see if this. I don't think this is going to solve the problem, but this would have to be here too, right? This needs to not be a continue, right? There we go. Um, so if we if we're missing x, right? We need to get x, and then we need to go around again. If we're missing y, we need to get y, and we need to go around again. But if we're missing the id and we get the id, then we need to continue down here. Um, and this does indeed give us the right answer, which is the score at the end of the game after you've you've beaten the game, which we just beat the game, right? Uh, because we're we're just having our paddle fo paddle follow the ball, and that's <laughs> that's enough to win the game. Uh, the end score is two 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 five, which is indeed the right answer. Now we just need to get this four three two, which is um, in the first go round. Like, what is the number of blocks 
So we can do that fairly easily by just saying in blocks equals zero or starts out at zero in blocks is a u size and if we get to the point the first time we'll be asked for input is after the first draw of the board so we can just say let mute first equals true and if you ever get the needs input right self dot in blocks equals byte count uh, count the number of twos in self dot display if first and then stop doing that so first equals false oh and these are these are not bytes the display should be bytes wait what oh uh, does this just have to be u8 This has to be a slice, not a reference to a vector. Oh, and it's the other way around. Where's what's where's the byte count crate? So the count function. Oh, it takes a haystack and a needle, so these just need to be reversed. Haystack, needle. There we go. And so in the end, right, this answer one should just be game dot in blocks. Let's cargo run that and see if we get the right answer. And we do. Um, so let's take the print lines out activate the tests and see if we pass 13 so cargo run cargo tests uh, release and while that's running we will start talking about how you draw this thing and turn it into WebAssembly uh, which is really the fun of all of this. I mean, this problem was, you know, fairly straightforward, um, not that complicated, but we just needed to do a little plumbing to make um, our computer single-threaded because if we want to run this in WebAssembly, we can't use multiple threads. Um, but as you can see, like, actually, the, the logic of creating this game is, like, fairly straightforward. Um, but how do we create a pretty, pretty display? Um, so that's a good question. So what I'm going to do is go to the WebAssembly book, not that one, this one, and project templates. So in the, the book that I said is the game, the game of Life book, which is the most useful, right? they have down here crates you should know, tools you should know, project templates. And the one that I sort of like is the Webpack template. Um, so this is going to be a little bit about JavaScript as well, which you can just do npm init rust webpack, I think. So let's in our in our top folder here, let's do npm init rust webpack. Oh, we want to create a project, so I'm going to create just a totally new folder called website. 
cd under website and run npm init um, rust webpack and hope this works. Is this how I did this before? So apparently, I, it's been a while, I'm not that familiar with the JavaScript ecosystem, but apparently NPM has the ability to like create a project template for you. And this will go sort of download off the interwebs. Uh, like a scaffolding that we can use for a, a project. And it uses, it uses Webpack, which is a, a well-known sort of transpiling tool that allows you to write ES6 and React and all that good stuff and have it compile to transpile, I guess is the right word, to straight up JavaScript that can run in the browser. And it uses this Rust loader thing because Webpack now supports um, WebAssembly and Rust. So if we see what this created for us, it created, um, so let's, uh, let's go back out. So we have this website folder in our main folder now, website. And if we go into website, we ran the scaffolding. So now we have this interesting scaffolding and we're gonna have to change some stuff. So uh, let's start with randomly our cargo.toml. So this is going to, we'll say this is AOC 2019 WASM. This is, uh, we, we don't need a description. Version authors, put your name in, right? So I'm Brian Myers, and my email address is brian.carl.myers at gmail.com. And we don't care about category, we don't care about a readme, edition, and I always like to add publish equals false. Um, so with WebAssembly, you need to create um, a C dilib uh, library, uh, which just basically compiles your library in a way that it can talk to C. Um, but for whatever reason, this is required when you compile to a WebAssembly target. Uh, this is not really that necessary, but this will uh, turn on link time optimizations, which means that Rust-C will try and optimize your code across crate boundaries. It makes compilation a little bit slower, but you'll end up with smaller binaries and faster binaries. And actually, while we're at it, why don't we add this to our main project uh, as well? So um, there's no reason why we can't suffer a little bit of worse compile times even in our main project. Quit, quit um, to get better um, to get better speed. So let's add link times optimizations to our main project as well. Why not? Um, okay. So back into website. I guess I'll do everything from here. So back into website and into the cargo.toml. So correct lib here. Oh, and I don't like when I mix JavaScript projects and uh, and Rust projects, right? Notice how in website here, the scaffolding gave us a JS folder and then a source folder. I like this to be named um, WASM. Um, and you can totally rename the source folder of a Rust project if you want to. You just have to come in here and say, oh, my library, where is it located? It's located at dot slash wasm slash lib dot rs. Um, and so now we can, we don't have to have a source folder. We can call our, our source folder wasm. Uh, features, features, we don't need any features. Dependencies. Um, so we need wasm bind gen, which I will explain in a little bit. And I don't think this is the latest version, but 0.2 is. We're gonna use we alloc. So we alloc is a tiny allocator, because uh, Rust has to, if you use heap allocations in your Rust code, um, the, um, the allocator has to be bundled up in your WASM file and sent over the wire. And uh, the Rust uses now, like, I think probably for WebAssembly targets, it probably defaults to using J malloc, um, which is a fine allocator and super fast and great and uh, used by Chrome and a bunch of web browsers and um, is sort of like an, a, a heap allocator, like a version of malloc and stuff like that that is um, sort of optimized for lots of little tiny allocations. Um, and I think that's the default you use with WebAssembly, but it's, it's big, it's very, very big. 
So our resulting WASM like files will be huge and you don't want them to be huge because now we're trying to send stuff over the internet. So we alloc is, as it says, a tiny allocator for WASM that is only 1K to encode size compared to the default allocator's 10K. However, it is slower than the default allocator so it's not enabled by default. But let's just use it. So we'll use we alloc and we'll not make it optional. We'll just straight up use it. Um, okay. And then WebSys is a crate that allows you access to all of the browser APIs. So one of those APIs is like, for example, being able to do console log, right? So if we wanted to console log something in the browser, um, like sort of the browser equivalent of, of print line, right? Uh, then this crate gives us access to that fairly easily. And let's, let's pull it in for now. I might get rid of this because we won't really want to do any console logging, but for debugging. Oh, and this is interesting. Console log panic hook. I want this. This is a crate that basically enables, if you ever panic in Rust, um, it will uh, log the stack trace to the console in the browser. Um, and so this is like always a neat crate to use. You might want to pull it out for like release versions of, of your code, but for right now we'll leave it in. So in case we run into any panics in our code, uh, we'll see it in the uh, browser console, which is nice. Um, so let's do away with this. And so we're not gonna do any testing. So I think, I think this is all the changes I wanna make for the moment to the cargo.toml of the template file. Um, all right, package.json. Here, you also need to say, I'm Brian Myers and brian.carl.myers at gmail.com. And this is, AOC 2019, version fine, scripts, build, we're not gonna have any tests. I happen to know that this will need node env equals, we need to set the environment variable. Let's just set it right away to production because I don't think we'll run into any problems. Escape those, no, I mean escape those that way. And this is also going to need the same. So if you guys are familiar, oh, and I don't want it to open my web browser each time. Stop doing that. Um, why do you have a problem? Because that can't be a comma anymore. Um, so uh, if you guys aren't familiar with JavaScript in your package.json, we can run uh, npm build now and npm start, and those will just run these commands. So rimraf will um, destroy the dist folder, which is not created yet, but when we, when we sort of run webpack and build everything, it's gonna put all of our build in a new folder called dist. So every time we build, we want to remove the old dist folder um, and the old package folder, because when we compile the WebAssembly, it goes into the, these two folders are created when we build, right? So we want to get rid of those folders and then rebuild again with Webpack. When we start, we also want to get rid of these folders and rebuild with uh, start up the Webpack dev server, uh, which I don't think creates these folders. I think they create their, this just runs everything in memory, but this won't hurt. Um, and anyway, um, we have all of the various dev dependencies that we need in order to have our project build. I like alphabetic order, so let's just move that there. Um, and as you can see, like to build a to build a Rust project or a WASM project with Webpack, you need Webpack, um, and you need this uh, WASM tool WASM pa pack plugin, which is an npm module. Which brings us, I guess, to our Webpack config. So if you guys, uh, I don't want this to be too much of a tutorial on how to use Webpack, but it's sort of unavoidable if you want to 
both write. So I want to write. I want to write like the latest and greatest JavaScript, um, and I want to use WebAssembly. And Webpack is the best way that I know about right now to do that. So we need this Webpack infrastructure. So this is all fine, except for except for I want to I don't like I don't want a separate static folder that seems like a bit much so I'm going to move our index.html into just the javascript folder so now we have in our javascript folder we have our main javascript file and our index.html and so that means in webpack right I don't want the copy plugin to copy the static folder I want it to just copy js index.html into our disk. So what this is going to do is any static files that don't need to be like transpiled or done anything with, this is going to just take uh, this file, right, and copy it into our disk folder when we build, I think. Um, and this is all fine. This is the WASMPack plugin that allows uh, everything to be built, uh, allows Rust to work with, web, uh, with, uh, with Webpack. Um, and everything else, I'm I'm more or less fine with in here, I think. Oh, uh, well, I'm not fine with everything in here, but we'll see that in a second. So, in our WASM folder, this is the basic template they give you for um, for your Rust library. So, we alloc is no longer a feature for us. It's just always there, and it's our global allocator. And the way you use a different allocator in Rust is you do this little magic. Um, you put global allocator here, and you create a static variable called alloc. And if, if we went to we alloc's sort of documentation, it would show you, like, hey, just these two lines to use a different allocator. Um, and then they have a main function for us. I don't really want a main function, but let's just create it so we can show, we'll run it with a main function for a second. So was, the way WASM bind gen it works is you annotate your Rust code with these WASM bind gen macros. And then as you will see, once we build it, like sort of creates a bunch of stuff for you to make it easily work. Um, but for right now, let's just follow the template. Um, so as you can see, console error panic hook, right, which we unconditionally now bring in because I changed the cargo.toml. This provides better error message in demug mode. Uh, and so if you looked up the documentation for console error panic hook, you would see you just call this function once in all of your code. And now if you panic in Rust, it will the stack trace will show up in the console in the browser, which is nice. So we want that. And then our code goes here, and I remember we're using WebSys, and so one way to console log is you say console log one, create a new JS value type, which comes from here. So we're basically creating a JavaScript object from a string. And so when we run this, hopefully it will just log out hello world to the console as soon as we launch the web page. Um, okay. Oh, and I just realized somebody's coming by my house at 3 o'clock, and so I'm going to have to take a break here, and I will be back after that's done. Okay, so I'm prepared for my visitor, so I might as well just keep recording until uh, she gets here. But where were we? We were at, oh yeah, the basics of a WebAssembly module. Um, console log parent code, console log, et cetera, et cetera. So tests, we're not going to use that because... I want to be lazy and this video is already too long. Um, we got rid of everything in the static folder. So, oops, delete you. Um, node modules is gonna be huge. And then, so now we can look in, I think we're, we've looked at everything here. We don't need to read me. Um, we can look in uh, index.html. So this just gives you a basic index.html. Let's say this is AOC 2019 day 13. And all it does is bring in our index.js for the moment, which is fine. And our index.js, all our index.js does is it's going to import a file 
that is going to be in a package directory here called index.js. And uh, WebAssembly modules need to be imported asynchronously, right? Because if you think about what happens, the JavaScript file will get sent over and downloaded and it'll start reading. And then when you import a web, something with WebAssembly in it, uh, first the browser needs to go fetch that file, but after it fetches the file, or while it's fetching the file, it also needs to compile the WebAssembly down to machine code so that the browser can run it. And that process sort of happens in the background. And so you need, this ends up being an asynchronous import. And so this, is a pro, this returns a promise, right? And in a promise in JavaScript, you can always catch the error, right? Uh, but because we have, all we have in our sort of Rust is we've annotated this to say wasm bind and start. And so by just importing the wasm module in our JavaScript code, this should run. So let's try and see if this halfway gets us something we want. So let's go to the website folder. And remember I said this, oh, let's delete package json.lock because I'm gonna do something else. I prefer instead of NPM, I prefer to use a program called yarn, which does the same thing as NPM, it's just faster. Um, and so let's do yarn init. So, oh no, not yarn init, get out. Yarn update, yarn install. And it will read our package.json file and install all of the um, NPM packages that we need. And actually let's do yarn upgrade, I think, because this template might be a little bit dated. And this will upgrade all of our um, all of our JavaScript dependencies, which it seems to have done. So now if we go into our package.json, it should have updated these. Um, all right, so now we just do yarn build, and it will run Webpack for us and do all of the magic. So this this relies on Wasmpack, but I think if you don't have Wasmpack installed, it will install it for you or tell you how to install it. And then we just compiled our Rust code, right? And then Webpack ran and outputted all of this stuff into our dist folder. So we should now have a dist folder, which we do. And if we ls dist, right? It outputted uh, index.js, index.html, a wasm file, and this one.js, whatever that is, some Webpack thing. Uh, so let's go in and look at these. So, oh, we also have a package folder. So when you run wasmpack, it creates this package folder, which is your your WebAssembly. So this is the WebAssembly we created, which again is a binary file, so it's gonna show up as junk. But it um, wasmpack will also create an index.js, which is kind of like a wrapper that just gives you access to, you can probably see down in here, Here's our main JS, right? So it exports a main JS function, um, which is just calling into our WASM modules main JS. So it, it imports, yeah, it imports our WASM and then sets up a bunch of glue. This is all like random glue code, which you can look into in your own in your own time, right? Um, but the main thing is whatever code we wrote will also be like available to JavaScript. And it even gives you TypeScript uh, type definitions if you are writing TypeScript instead of JavaScript, which is nice. So you can see we have a, this module has a main.js function, which returns nothing. Um, we have access to the WebAssembly memory, right? So that is all good stuff that WASMPack gives you. And then in dist, right? Um, this is what Webpack created. So if we look at our index.html should just have been copied in, uh, which the copy plugin does. And index.js, sort of because I have it on production mode, it's like, you know, a bunch of stuff. But if we find in here somewhere, it should be um, import. No. Well, let's see if this works. So quit, quit. Okay. So let's run yarn 
start, which should run a the Webpack dev server. And everything compiled successfully, and it's running at localhost 8080. So let's go to let's go to localhost 8080, which I have bookmarked here, and we get a blank page. But if we look at the console, our Rust it called our Rust code and printed hello world. So this is Rust code running in the browser. Uh, so let's quit out of that. Quit. And try and make this a little bit better. So um, I always like to use React for my websites. So I'm going to show you how we can sort of build our website with React, um, which again, this is not going to be really a tutorial in React, but it's going to be um, just give you the basics. So one thing I like to do, let's come back out here and just do create React app which is something you need to download, but it just Google this and you'll figure out where it is. Um, we'll call it foo, and we'll just get a blank React app in a foo folder in our main folder. It's going to download a bunch of stuff, blah, 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 blah. more stuff all right so now we have we should have a foo folder with a blank sort of create react app template in it so let's go in here and I want to do I want to earn yarn eject because um, create react app doesn't sort of expose all the configuration for you unless you do this so yarn eject are you sure you want to eject this action is permanent yes I do can't do this without track changes. So remove foo. Go to a completely temporary folder and create react app uh, foobar. Sorry, we're going to have to go through this again. Because all I want to do is eject so that I can steal some configuration from this uh, scaffolding. So we can pull in React. I could probably build this myself, but it's easier to steal it from them. We just need to wire up uh, Webpack so that it works with React as well. I don't know why you're asking for that. But if we go into foobar now, and we run yarn eject, you should not get mad at me. Yes, permanent, eject. All right, you're doing some things. So now we have an ejected create React app scaffold. And I want in here in config, well, actually in source, first of all, I want to see index.js and I want all this business. So let's, uh, split screen. Let's, in our website, index.js, let's steal this business from them. So we need React, we need React DOM, no CSS. We're going to have an app component, no this, no that. That's fine. Um, that's what index.js is going to be, which means we need Oops, we need an app.js and we're going to steal that from over here, source app.js and in app.js we're not going to have a logo, we're not going to have CSS, we're going to use new JavaScript, functional component, and it's going to return just hello world for the moment. And we 
we're going to export it and that is going to be our app component which means an index.html which I'll also uh, steal from here this is all good stuff that is better than our janky index.html So char set, yes, no icon, viewport fine, theme color fine, description, uh, I don't know, AOC 2019, day 13. Apple Touch icon, no manifest, yada yada yada. No script, that's good, you need JavaScript, yep. And we've got div ID root, and we should be good. But we need to bring in our script, right? Script. Is it source? Let me cheat and look at lib practice to website js index.html. Yeah, this is how you bring in a script tag. Source. There we go. So that's fine. Oh, I also added, I added bootstrap. We can add that just for fun. We're not going to use it, but this is how you add bootstrap, uh, which is a sort of styling thing. Um, if you want to look that up, just go look at bootstrap's website. We probably, did, I mean, we don't need all this stuff. In fact, let's just do away with it. We don't need this. This website is going to be super simple. Um, okay. So that's, that's a better index.html. I guess it didn't really add much. But the real key thing in this create react app that I want is to go into config and webpack config and steal this stuff that they use for JavaScript files, which is down here. Um, not optimization. I don't care about any of this stuff. Where is JS? Oh, here it is. These rules for allowing us to use um, JSX and new JavaScript. So we need this stuff. And in our webpack config, we'll come down here and we'll add a modules section. And close off the close off, come back up here, close off that, put a comma. Uh, do you need another one? There's something busted here, so here, move all of you over this way. Module, strict, export, presence. I don't know what that means. Do I with that? Rules. Oh, the rules is not closed. There we go. So, I don't want that. I don't want that. I just want, if you have a JS file, or a JSX file, or a TypeScript file, to oh I don't want I don't want any of that I pulled in the wrong thing but if you do have one of those files then I want you to I want you to do this stuff right and 
include, but resolve Babel loader, webpack overrides, I don't know what that is, but fine. I don't think we need any of this stuff. And cache directory, all that stuff is fine. Um, I think this is what we need to use React. And then the other thing we'll need is in package.json, we'll need um, some extra things. So we're using Babel now to transpile our ES6 into regular JavaScript. So we need, probably need Babel core. Oops. We probably need um, Babel loader. I don't think we need named asset import. And we got preset react. We don't need any of this stuff. And then we need react. And we need react DOM. And then we need down here we need to tell Babel what preset we're using. So we can do React. And I think actually React needs to be a dependency. Dependencies. React and React DOM are actually going to get sent down to the browser, right? The rest of the stuff is just for building. So I think I think that's all I wanted to steal from Create React App. Let's go back to lib AOC 2019. Open this up and go to website and JS. We got app should work, all this stuff should work. So let's try and build now. Oops, CD website. Yarn build. Uh oh. That did not work. Cannot find, but oh, because we didn't do yarn install. We got to install all these things that we added to our package.json including Babel, etc. And now let's try a yarn build. And it built. Let's try a yarn start. And we should have a hello world h1 tag and we should have still our Rust code logging to the console. So let's reload. And we indeed have hello world, but our Rust code, oh, our Rust code is obviously not running because we're not importing uh, an index dot, well, let's do it in app actually. Um, let's just say for the moment, import um, from package index, import this asynchronously catch console.log all right so let's um let's try and run let's try and run that web pack the web website there we go yarn uh, start And our Rust code is still working. Okay, good. Um, fantastic. Let's quit out of this. Go back a thing and open up again because I already prepared the JavaScript code. I'm not going to walk you guys through like drawing to, I'm not gonna write this out by hand. I'm gonna just walk you through it. So this was prepared ahead of time. 
but if we go under our website, app is now going to look something like this. Let's see if I can explain this. And let's see if it'll compile. It does compile. It's not going to work because Rust game is not a constructor, yada, 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 but we'll see what we're going to do. So we have a, we have a component, a React component called app. It's going to accept some props um, that are the width and the height of the canvas we're going to be drawing to. But if you don't send it any props, it's going to default to the um, Windows inner width and the Windows inner height. So it's going to fill up the entire page. Um, but in any case, we, we get a width and a height, blah, blah, blah. We, uh, it's the HTML it's actually going to return is just a canvas element. So we're going to have a canvas element and some React nonsense where you sort of need to, you need to define using react.useRef like a reference to that canvas. And when we actually create the element, it's going to, its ref is going to be that, right? So this will, once once the component paints, right, this will actually be a reference to the canvas that we can use. And we tell the canvas we want it to be width and height, right, which we passed in as props, but if we didn't pass them in, they default to the window size. Um, and then in functional React with React with hooks, right, this is the equivalent of uh, component did mount. You do React use effect, and you just say, hey, once the component mounts, get a handle to the canvas, um, and then create a new game, uh, which is gonna be this. Create a new game, pass the canvas, and then once you have the game, because this is gonna need, need to be asynchronous, then run the game. So that's, that's our entire application right there uh, from React. And then we have this game. Uh, class, right? And so the constructor to this game, well, we're going to need an asynchronous constructor. So uh, I think the way to do that, or a good way to do that in JavaScript is to create a static async method, new, right? It needs this canvas reference, which we pass up here. And then it um, imports our Rust module asynchronously, and it imports the WASM module itself asynchronously, and then it creates a new game. So it comes down here to this constructor, the game constructor, once we have the Rust and WASM module, which you got asynchronously here, then we can construct our game. So our game is going to, uh, this, is a, this is a Rust function, right? Which is the going to be like calling game new, right? except for we're calling it from JavaScript now. So we're out of a game struct in our Rust code, and it's gonna have a new method, and th this will create a game, which we store. Um, and then we create a new canvas, which is this stuff down here. Um, and that canvas needs to know, well, it needs to take a reference, that, it needs to have that reference to the canvas there. And then it needs to know the number of columns, the number of rows. And then I just store I store the entire WASM module, um, which we imported here. I store that on this game class. And this game class is going to have a run method, and all it's going to do is it's going to take our Rust game struct, call step on it, and that's going to get us the next move. Um, so we're going to write our Rust code so that the game struct in Rust has a step method that outputs what the next move should be. Uh, which is actually going to be an option. So if the next move is undefined, then we'll, we're done and we'll just quit the game. If, however, we have a next move to do, which is either going to be move left, move right, you know, or stay put, then we're going to render the um, render the game, which is this method, um, and then we're going to tell our Rust version, our Rust struct, that our next move wants to is this. And then we're going to wait for 50 milliseconds, and then we're going to do it all again, right? So this is a loop that will only break when step returns none, our Rust code returns none, but otherwise it will uh, render the game every 50 milliseconds. 
Um, and then render is, well, just a whole bunch of stuff to use the Canvas API. I'm not going to go into this, but the, I just created a, my own little Canvas struct that um, can clear the screen, draw a border, draw a ball, uh, draw a block, draw the score. Um, I don't want to explain this thing this to you guys, but it's fairly self-explanatory if you look at the code. Um, and so anyway, in our render method, right, every time we want to render, we clear the canvas, we draw the border, we draw the score, which is on our Rust, is going to be a method on our Rust struct to get the score out. Uh, we get out the display. So this is interesting. So we can directly access the memory buffer of the WASM module. So remember, we imported directly up here the WASM module itself. And then we stored it in game. So down here, we can get the WASM module itself. It has a memory buffer, which uh, is like some sort of type handle to like the entire buffer of, uh, of WASM. So if the game can tell us the pointer at which uh, the display starts, as well as the length of the display buffer, we can turn the display into a JavaScript UNT8 array. So now we have a JavaScript UNT8 array, UNT array that is looking directly into Rust's memory, right? At the right place because the game knows where it stores its display buffer. Um, and then we just uh, get the number of columns out and we say, and we draw, right? So you say for display, which remember in Rust is just a vector of bytes. For each byte, right, uh, we get the what the y coordinate should be, which is uh, math.floor i divided by calls. And we get what the x coordinate should be. Um, and then we say if the byte is nothing, well, don't draw anything because that's empty. If the byte is one, well, then uh, draw. I think this is a wall, right? So draw a wall. If the byte is two, it's a block, so draw a block. If the byte is three, it is the paddle, so draw the paddle. And if the byte is four, it's the ball, so draw the ball. Um, and we're essentially done. I'm getting a text. Oh, I've got to, the person I'm meeting with is here, so I've got to take another break. See you guys soon. All right, I'm back. And where were we? Oh, uh, yeah, so we were explaining the JavaScript code. Um, but it looks like what we need to do is we need a Rust module that exposes a constructor function for a game struct and a with a step that has a step method on it that returns the next move that has an input method on it that allows us to push input into the computer, and that has a display method that returns a pointer to uh, the display vector, and the display lin method that returns the length of the display vector. Oh, and that the game struct also needs to know the number of columns and number of rows. And we should be good. And hopefully I will code this up fast because this is a very, very long video. Um, but let's go into our WASM module. Well, first of all, we're going to need, as a dependency, right, we're going to need our actual AOC 2019 crate, which should be available at this path, dot, dot, slash, just dot, dot. So if we go up on directory from here, right, we'll be in here. Um, and we've named our regular AOC library, AOC. So let's do that and let's see if we can build with AOC. So yarn build, oh no, CD website, yarn build. And see now it's pulling in, it is compiling our old crate and that's good. So we need to make sure we've exposed publicly in our regular library the game struct because we're going to need it. So pub use day 13 game, right? 
and let's go back into day 13 game and see what else is in here. So we have a run, we have a, a public game struct. It's got a public new method, which is good. It's got a public run method. What we really need to do, we need to know the next step. It's got a display method that returns a pointer to, actually we can make this for the Rust code, we can make this just this. The actual Rust code. We don't need that. These will have to be methods on. What we really need is a step method, right? Um, so let's make this step and have it return the next thing that we do. Oops, an option of the next thing that we do. So run can look like this at mute self result error when we call run we will just in a loop uh, match on self dot step and if that is okay next move then we will do self dot computer dot input mute dot in queue next move if it's none then we will break and here we'll do okay Here we will say, we will not do these things, we will just return OK sum of 1, and here we'll return OK sum of negative 1, and here we'll return OK sum of 0. should probably work, but why are you yelling at me here? Oh, because this is sum. Oh, which needs first needs to be first needs to be a global state, right? Or not global state, but state on the struct first false or bool. So let's not do this anymore. Let's say if self dot first self dot first equals false. And let's do cargo test. to see if we still pass just for our regular Rust library. No, I don't want to be in that folder. I want to be in this folder. Cargo test. So what I'm what I'm hoping is that this test still passes because we just changed our computer to have a step method instead of just a run method. And it looks like it passes. So we are good there. And that means that we can go into our WASM library. So website WASM 
lib, and we would be able to pull in use AOC 2019 game, which should be available, and we'll create a new struct here called game, and it will just be a wrapper around our other library's game, and we'll impl game, and game needs a pub function step method, which returns a result of an option of a USOT or an I64 or a JS value because it, in order to return all the errors I think in WASM crates need to be JS values um, so all we need to do is just call self.0.step which returns what we want but we want to map that error we'll get back our type of error and we just create a JS value uh, well, a, a string can be converted into a JS value so if we just do format e we turn our error into a string and that should be good and we also need a we said we needed a display method which returns a pointer to our display star const u8 so self.0 dot display as pointer we need display lin which returns a u size and that just returns self dot display dot lin and we need, uh, I think this can be const, uh, function rows. And this returns a u size, and it returns self.0.rows. And we need calls, which returns self.0.calls. And we need an input function. which returns nothing and just says self.0.input dot zero dot input mute dot in q um, val i64 val but for that we're probably gonna need our q trait in scope which means that needs to be public so let's go back up here and say we will expose also the Q trait. Q is private, so come in here. Oh, Q is on our computer, not in day 13. Pub use day. Pub use. Let's make our computer. So if we come down here and go back in here, this actually needs to be, uh, that's correct, that's correct, that's correct. This needs to be self.0.computer. Mm, let's not expose the computer. Let's create an input method on the game. So in day 13, we just need to come down here and add pub function input, which takes a mutable self and a value, and just does self.computer.inputmute.inq val. which means we don't really even need to expose the computer or Q, which means down here we should be good. We don't need this anymore. Um, 
Oh, we need a new method. Pub function new, which returns a game. And here is where we will. I guess you can only set this once, but we'll only instantiate our. We don't need console log anymore. We don't need any of this stuff anymore. Um, but this needs to read in the ROM and create the game, right? So let's say bytes is include bytes. So we'll just pull this in as a static. We'll just pull this in statically. So if we go up to and into data and into 13.txt, we'll have the bytes of our input. We want to create a reader, which is IO reader new of bytes, which means we'll need use standard IO. And then we'll say let ROM equals ROM from reader, reader means this can fail, but we need to return a JS value as the error. And so this needs to map error E format. Well, I guess we don't need to use format. We can just say E to string, right? Which means this can just be E to string. Probably have to do that too. That next move equals. So, oh, this is already an option. Next move. Which means we're going to need the ROM. So we don't need a queue, but we need the ROM exposed. So lib. Pub use computer ROM. ROM is private, so in computer, I think this might be because this needs to be. Oh no, not computer. Pub use self computer. But ROM is still private uh, because struct ROM, this needs to be public now. And this needs to be public now because we're going to use it from a different crate. All right, so you should no longer have a problem, which means you can be imported there which means I can create a ROM from reader. And then I need to create a game. AOC 2019 game new. And I think to create a new game, we just passed it. What do we pass it? Oops. Day 13. We just pass it a ROM. OK. A reference to a ROM will be fine. Which means we don't even need to, or yeah, we do need to pull. We need to do a pull on that, so that's fine. And then this is self game. Okay, self game. All right, so let's go on the website and see if that builds cargo or no yarn build. Oh, uh, we, don't, we can't call this game. This needs to be self. Fn. Uh, oh, uh, buff reader.
this needs to be a slice, so we can make it a slice instead of an array by doing that. And so now our create has correctly compiled. So now all we need to do is add all the the wasmbindgen magic stuff. So let's go over here and find wasmbindgen. And I guess the wasmbindgen documentation. Hello world. So the way you add the wasmbindgen magic There's gotta be an example some here that we can use with a struct. No. No. Exported Rust types. Oh, here we go. It just shows you on a struct, you put this annotation and there's something you can do for constructors, a constructor. So on your new method, you just say, this is a constructor. And we also annotate the implementation block so that all of these public functions now will be exposed to JavaScript. And so will this one, but it will be viewed as the constructor for the game type, and the game type is exposed. And so now if we build, it should still work. It does not. You cannot have const functions in WebAssembly. So don't be const. And we, we built and we compiled. Um, Let's see if I am using this correctly in the JavaScript code. So yarn run, or yarn start. Let's run our Webpack server, development server. And come here and go to localhost. Oh, hey, we drew. Um, we drew the border at least. Let's see what's wrong. Console. This dot game dot score is not a function, right? Because we've got to expose a score function, which will return an i64, which will just be self dot zero dot score, which means we need to add that to our game type in the regular crate. Um, so this needs a score method that's public. So that's yarn build again and yarn start. Reload. Reload. Oh, it's still building. Uh, reload. There we go. And here's our game. Running uh, new tick every 50 milliseconds. And let's, uh, let's uh, speed it up. Where do we set the speed? Uh, that's in our JavaScript code. In our app, we have, let's make it go super fast every three milliseconds and see what that does. Everything's working, now refresh, and you should go a lot faster. Why are you not refreshing?
There we go. Now we're going a lot faster, and we can watch it go all the way to the end, and then I'm going to commit this to GitHub and be done with day 13. But hopefully this was um, like just a fun little thing to show you how you can mix uh, Rust and WebAssembly and React and get the basics of a project going. We're using the Canvas API to draw on the screen. Um, and you can see what this computer does uh, to um, what this program is, the, the game that it runs. Um, if we were more ambitious, we could actually make it so you could play this game instead of having the AI uh, just follow the ball around. We could try and uh, take keyboard input or something um, and, uh, and do that, but that was just a little bit too much work and this video is already like well over two hours long. <laughs> But as you can see, we finished the game, and it's it's up here sort of poorly done, but here's our final score, 22215, which should be um, the correct answer. So if we go back to um, day 13, and we look down here, that is indeed the right answer that we should have been getting. And so there is um, there's day 13, like, all complete. So let's quit and see. Let's see, let's go back into this website directory and make sure that we have a git ignore that's ignoring the right files. So we don't want node modules, don't want dist. We don't have a target. Because I have my target target there, but we'll leave that in there. Don't want package and we'll pack that log. Uh, we can this yarn error.log we can um, not include as well. Oops. Git ignore yarn error dot log get status uh, I think we want everything else So to run the website, you just go into the website directory and you say yarn start. And this will run a development server, uh, compile the code, run a development server, and everything should work. As long as you have yarn installed on your system. Try it one more time. Over here we'll run all of our tests. In release mode. Oops. Working? Yep, you're working. Oh, and you just go to localhost 8080 in your web browser. So I'll quit you because I'm compiling and you're making my computer slow. So after the test run, uh, we'll commit all this stuff to GitHub. can't wait for the tests. We'll fix it if it's wrong. Using all my cores to compile. Alright, so we have day 13. Let's see if it pulled in too much stuff here. We just have three JS files, a WASM directory with our library, cargo.lock, cargo.toml, package.json, webpack config, cargo.lock. That all looks good. And we have day 13 here. Oh, that's not right. Oh, because I only ran, I only ran in that directory. So git add all, git commit m, day thirteen again. 
get push. So now we have not only the stuff from the website, we should have stuff from Yep. And here is our game. In our regular code that gets us the right answer. But now we also have a neat website that will um, output everything pretty. And I'll just wait for these tests to pass, which I'm sure they will, and then uh, I'll sign off. So as, uh, as I mentioned several times before, if you guys have any feedback on these videos, if, they're, um, uh, if there's any way I can be presenting uh, these things better um, or trying to impart what little knowledge of Rust I have onto you uh, in a better way, please let me know. The purpose of this is to be educational. I want you guys to learn Rust. Um, and again, it's my way of giving back because I've learned a lot uh, as I probably mentioned before here, I'm a hobbyist programmer. I knew nothing about programming, call it two years ago, three years ago, um, and pretty much everything I've learned has been from either reading blog posts or watching YouTube. Um, I haven't taken a course, I haven't bought a book, um, and so I think with what's available out there these days, you can really teach yourself a lot, and I just want to give back a little bit and share some of my rest knowledge. So hopefully it's helpful to you guys. And, uh, and useful. It looks like all our tests pass and we're good and we have the right answers. And so I'm going to sign off and I'll see you guys next time for day 14. Thanks.